All right. Welcome to Rich Conversations. I am joined by Rafael Guzman, all the way from Santiago, Chile. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me back. Why, why don't you uh, briefly reintroduce yourself? Well, um, I'm currently 27 years old. I am Chilean, but I'm also American. My mom is American and my dad is Chilean. Um, I majored in political science and I currently work at my local government here. And that's pretty much uh, the most important part about me. See, Raphael is a very um, interested individual in how cities operate, how governments operate, how we can work more together so that more people benefit from services and, and just live better. So I, I love having you on. We, we had a great conversation last time and I'm energized for this one as well. Wonderful. Okay, so first question I have. It's been a while since we talked. I, I like picking the brains of a lot of people and I want to explore more of this question and that's what does your like on on your best day what does your ideal morning look like okay my my ideal morning it will be waking up early because i always wake up and late but i i, I never show up late to work but i i will show up early that that will be ideal for myself um, it will be, the best morning will be, um, right after my paycheck, right after <laughs> I get my paycheck. Totally. Because I can, I can go get breakfast before going to my office and I can go through Starbucks or go through the supermarket, get a coffee, grab a, a croissant or grab a pastry and arrive very happy to my desk, have breakfast and start working. That would be my okay. perfect morning. It it hasn't happened in a while, you know. <laughs> because because of the paycheck or because you just have it? Um not because of the paycheck. I got my paycheck like this week, but okay. I I got up late. So I wasn't able to enjoy my morning that much to okay. seize the morning. I just commute by bus and that's all I have to run to my office because otherwise I would get late there. Okay. How long does it take you to commute from your house to your work? Not much. It's like um, between walking, waiting the bus, riding the bus, it will be something like 30 to 40 minutes. It's not that much. Yeah, that's not too bad. That's pretty that's pretty standard, I would say. Um Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so what what's the breakfast? Like what's your breakfast of choice? My breakfast of choice will be well, this is a very Chilean answer. It will be um coffee with milk. Let's say Ca with cafe milk. con leche. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, but we will say a little bit poshy will be like cortado with a, with a ham and cheese sandwich. Okay. That would be like my standard breakfast. Okay. So you have, you have the coffee, you get to work, and then you're just, you're ready to go for work. Yes. Do you notice any difference if you like get to work on time versus early versus late, like, and how that affects the rest of your like work. Day. Oh yes. Um, well, when I get up earlier, I get, uh, less traffic jams because I got mm -hmm. stuck in traffic a lot here because, uh, I live in a place we where most people drive to their, to their office or okay. drop the kids at school 
so I get stuck in traffic a lot. Or the bus is just too crowded that it's very hard to ride it, or I will have to go standing. And one thing I like is to read during my commute. I like reading during my commute. It's part of like my um, transit um, routine. Yeah. Like my transit ritual of every morning. I have to read something, listen to music, read something. And that's pretty much how I transition from home to work. And well, when I get up late, the bus is rather crowded much more crowded mm. and I will have to wait longer for traffic jams because the bus can get on time to the bus stop. Um, it really makes a change. Just yeah. 10 minutes of difference will make a big difference in terms of how early or how late I can get to work. Yeah. Do you feel like, like when it, the bus is crowded and it's a little later, do you feel like more not agitated, but just kind of like irksome or not calm. Does that affect anything or no? Not really. I pretty much assume, okay, I'll be late today. I can't do anything to help it. Maybe yeah. sometimes I will um, use Uber, but I don't like to use Uber because it's expensive and yeah. it's like, a punishment for myself because um to take the bus it will take it will cost me like less than a dollar but to take uber will will cost me like that um uh, like five or six dollars yeah so not cheap not nice it could have been my my ideal breakfast for instance instead of a mm -hmm. of a car but I try to avoid it as much as possible and take the bus anyways, even yeah. if I have to run to the bus stop to get the next bus. So when you, when you say reading, are you reading fiction, nonfiction, um, news articles? Like what, what does that look like? I mostly read nonfiction. Okay. It's yeah, been a nice. while since I read a, a novel or a fiction book other than poems or poetry. I'm currently reading a book. It's called uh, Happy Cities. Uh, I don't, re I can't oh, remember the I know that one. Uh, it's by, oh, you know uh, it. they start out, they're talking about Colombia, right? Yes, they start talking about Colombia. It's that like bright colored uh, cover. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, it has like drawings. It's, I've enjoyed that book so much, so much. And it's perfect for your commute since you start <laughs> you to see, think You actually about, see what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. You see actually what is happening. And like the book, it's actually describing what's going on on the bus, what you're thinking, what the um, behavior of commuters are. <clears throat> yeah. So it's really interesting. I. I think that book is, um, I got it in the U.S. actually, but it it was uh, covered in dust for many years on my bookshelf. But I decided yeah. to stop that and start reading older books that I have on my bookshelf. And I decided to go for that one. Yeah, I'm trying to, uh, I'm in my office right now. I don't know if I have this other book. Have you read... Uh... I don't know. I have multiple copies of this book. Uh, the Fu the history of future cities. Okay, never heard, heard of that, that one. one. Yeah. Now, trying to look it, for the one I'm reading. Yeah, I have two now. copies of that one. You'd be interested in that one, I feel like. It okay it was um, Charles Montgomery's Happy City. Yeah, that's the yeah, book. Yeah, that's that one. I didn't finish it. Yeah, but. I started it and I was interested in no, it. No, I think it's a great book. It's a great book. It's outstanding and it 
it points out many important aspects of what we should take in, in account for building new cities and building the cities of the future. And well, I have so much to say about it because I've changed my view on American cities ever since my last time I visited and how car infested American cities are. <laughs> okay. This okay, this is this is gonna be fun. This is uh something I've grown more interested in, urban design and and how it affects um residents and people that live there and countries and um something I know from you is you're really interested in in public transportation. And the movement yeah. of people, um, not only into cities, but around cities and, you know, how you move people from A to B. Um, what, what has been, what city are you most impressed with in the world that you've been? And what's your impression of American cities as far as design? Okay, so two questions. Uh, the most impressed. I would say um, Stockholm. Like, Stockholm. I went there like 13 years ago today. And okay. it's been a long time, but I was really impressed with their with their public transportation system it's it has grown much more right now like they have more tram lines and they have um, many plans for subway expansions but the way they work and the way the city is pedestrian oriented and people oriented it feels fantastic like mm. you can commute anywhere from anywhere to anywhere by train, bus, or subway, even trans right now, or ride your bike, and it's fine. And you have the actual liberty of movement, the actual freedom for commuting. And that feels great. And I think Stockholm is a perfect example because it's not a huge city. Like the metro area has like one... One million, one and a half million inhabitants, okay. kind of thing. So it's, it's not huge, but you know, it has a really comprehensive uh, transit network and it works. It just works and it's fine and people are happy about it. And mm -hmm. when you see examples like this one, you start thinking maybe. Public investment in transit is not a waste, but an investment. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge example. And the fares, the fare rates, the fare system, it's like so convenient. You can get a an annual ticket, month tickets, um, an all day ticket. You have so many options and it's so convenient. Like you wouldn't think sometimes you wouldn't even think about riding your car anywhere in Stockholm. It's like, are you nuts? Why are you riding your car? You can just take the subway. And that's all. So what do you think of American cities? Who are more car-oriented, of course, too. <laughs> okay, I have... Um very bad feelings for yeah. American cities and what they have become in the last century um, ever since the car, the private car got its boom after the First World War. It's been almost like thinking cities in a very rational way, but we forgot that we are human beings and we are not always being rational and we don't always take the best decisions like um in a more economical perspective 
I will say that to think about the human being as a rational, um, as a rational decision maker is misleading because we, we don't make the most rational decisions. Most Americans think about living in suburbia because downtown is like a wasteland or it's dangerous or has high crime rates. And we prefer to live in a place with our own grass lawn, with a swimming pool at the backyard, with a nice car garage with space for four cars. But but they have so much junk in it that they can only fit one and a half in. Yeah, but at what cost? Like you will have to commute one hour to your to your work every day like back and forth two hours a day and you will have to use your car to go do the groceries go to the doctor go to any other activity see your friends and that's a waste of time because you live far away from everything and you never get to walk so at the end you end up being more miserable because you don't have time to enjoy your house and the house itself is a waste of pay- of space because those ha- houses are so big that you like for example why do you need three rooms if you're a single person or just a couple you don't need more rooms more than let's say one two rooms and that's all so american cities are being were were um planned as as people figure out freedom was like back in the 40s back in the 50s but it's no longer what freedom is like and we are freer not when we go where we want to go at any time but if we go there by any means that's what I believe and let's be honest um, car infrastructure has uh, done lots of damage to American cities with lots of with parking lots taking up up to one third of the total surface of the cities and uh, highways um, running through entire neighborhoods or bulldozing downtown for the sake of cars and the freedom of mobility that was associated to cars but fortunately we know that that's not the answer anymore and more cities in america are starting to orient themselves towards transit and public service and i think that's a good point in our favor um for oh. example denver has a very yeah, comprehensive light rail um network um but they do have to improve their bus service which is terrible like i live in south america and and developed continent and we have better bus service than they do there Mm. america is so into their cars i don't own a car um you don't i don't I haven't owned I'm a car. Surprised. Yeah. Well, I've lived in Chicago for 15 years or so. Um, I had a car for probably 10 of that. And it's it's a luxury. It's not it it's not a necessity. And it actually I I sold it like two and a half years ago, and it's such a mental burden off my mind. I like try and i'm not trying to go back at all and now i live on a farm and i just go back and forth and i i uh ride a bike or we have like a farm utility vehicle i just go back and forth and just make it work with other people that have cars but the car dependency in america the like Everyone's into their cars. Commercials on TV, every third advertisement is for a new car. This is my theory. After World War II, 
America experienced this economic boom because they're essentially like the only economy in the world um, yeah. left standing. And then in Asia country, Asian countries they haven't developed yet. And so there's this very prosperous time. And so before this, you had the Great Depression and people aren't having a great life. The standard of living is not good. And now all of a sudden you could own a car, you could get a job. You could own a house with a lawn and have your own kind of private space. So people went out to the suburbs. And so everything kind of developed with the suburbs. At the same time, when you remove a lot of the people and the people from cities, especially ones that are, are making good income, have uh, certain jobs, it creates a vacuum. And so then there's a reduction in ability to have services, ability to create more, generate more energy, because it's it's going somewhere that is also just like spread out. It's not consolidated. It's just kind of taking up a lot of space and land and not really efficient in how it's approached. But there's this American dream idea of, you know, buying a house, having a car, raising a family on the suburbs, kind of this this kind of life. Um, but now, as someone who lived in a city, it's so much more cost effective. It's you get so much more value with your money and time. It's it's really baffling um but i i'm wondering how in the future we can better design american cities knowing that it's hard for people to reduce their obsession with car culture or owning cars and what what would optimal american cities look like with this consideration in mind that people already are all about their cars, it's going to be hard for them to switch. How do you, you know, transition that in a way? Well, they are, there are many factors to be addressed here. Like when I think about an ideal example for an American city, I will point out maybe, have you ever been to Boston? I have, but I was quite young. I was like 13. Okay, yeah, 14, quite young. Maybe. Yeah. Well, um, okay, let's not take Boston, but a generic example. Like the the grid neighborhoods, like, you know, those old neighborhoods that were uh, once streetcar oriented, mm -hmm. that they were built in order to be convenient for people to take public transportation, like, America used to have the most modern and developed transit system worldwide, and they dismantled it for the sake of cars and um, motor and oil companies. And it was a huge damage done to American cities. And whenever I think about an ideal example, uh, we have to address many problems. Like first, we need more investment in public transportation. Like we cannot discard buses because no one used them. Uh, we have to invest more in buses so people use it. Even subsidize the, um, the fares and make it more frequent, make it more... Um, convenient to take the bus instead of the car and also we have to make a change with our land use policies because we have this uh, segregated land use which is like single family homes and industrial development and uh, commercial development but we have everything like apart we have everything separated 
And the best way of having people walking and building up communities and not through these um, vicious um, homeowners committees against public transportation and development in most of the suburb, uh, suburban places in the U.S. is to build more mixed use land. Are you talking in cities or in suburbs? Everywhere. Every, okay. Everywhere. In cities, like expand downtown cores with mixed use developments. Like, in, you're even saying these, America, uh, right? Friends. Yes. Okay. And it, I, I will say that it's the perfect formula for everywhere. And America needs like the middle part of land development. Like, we have this huge skyscraper apartment buildings in New York. And we have the single family homes everywhere else. But there's that missing middle part. Like you don't have to do a skyscraper for apartments. You can just do a small, I don't know, four stories apartment building or five stories apartment buildings. And that would be fine. And on the first floor, you can locate all the shops and the commerce you want to do and some offices. That's the thing that makes a city more interesting and that makes a place you want to live in. So it's it's like kind of the regulation of how land is developed and used. Yeah, I, I think uh, land regulations in the U.S. are rather rigid compared to other places. Like I would never think about an apartment building being built in the middle of a suburb that's unthinkable and homeowners homeowner committees will never allow it <laughs> yeah it's a lot of that um existing property owners not wanting <laughs> yeah and and you know i even have to deal with that with my job here and but not with apartment buildings, but with more transportation. You know, I work for a rather wealthy city hall here in Santiago. And most neighborhoods look like a, a suburban street in the U.S. Mm. So um, there are many similarities. And people don't want, for example... They think about, okay, we maybe we need a bus line so workers and housekeepers and gardeners can get to their work easily. But when they come to think about having a bus stop in front of their houses, they get nuts. Like, no, they don't want that because they... They will get, um, I don't know, um, criminals, crime rates higher or drug consumption. I don't know. It's like they associate transit with low, low quality life and low class or poor people. So there's this negative association with transit that it's also associated in the U.S. with transit. Yeah, I was in LA in March and I had no idea they had a subway. I've lived, yeah, they do. I've lived 30 some years. I lived 35 years and didn't know they had a subway because all uh, mo most movies are made in Los Angeles uh, and New York, but never in these movies that take place in LA have I seen a subway in LA but it actually they actually have one and it goes to different places and I've used it I used it several different times um I also used the bus system so I only took two Ubers that entire trip um in Los Angeles one coming from the airport going to an Airbnb and then the second one was going from one side of the city 
in Westlake to a friend's in Venice Beach. And time was time was an issue. So I took an Uber, but those were the mm -hmm. only times. And I, I took public transportation the other times because I'm like you. I'm very inspired by like, I want to check this out. I want to see how it operates. I want to see the goods and the bads and like what actually is. And um, and it's, it's uh, I don't know. It's just interesting to see all of that. I like, and in Miami, when I go to Miami, I buy a seven day um, Miami mover, not Miami mover, um, their public transportation pass. And I just ride that the entire week that I'm in Miami over the last few years. And are you able to do it, it in like in Miami with public transportation only? Yeah, I only took in a week. I only took two Ubers. One was to record with oh. someone in Miami Beach and it was a time crunch. And the other one was I was out late and I had to get back and public transportation wasn't operating at that time. Oh, wow. So I I must admit that I thought that Miami's public transportation was a bit, was rather crappier than I thought. <laughs> I no, I thought it was quite it was effective for my trip. Like I would stay there for a week. The last few years, four years, I've been to Miami for a week or so. And I just get a like a seven day pass for 30 bucks, mm -hmm. 33 bucks ish. And then I just take that That's around. That's very cheap. Yeah. So, I mean, like, think how much money I saved from just, like, taking buses. And I get to see the city a little more. And um, yeah. yeah, I see the exactly. locals. I see the, the, the yeah. local locals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and that's one of the best things because you're not driving. Yeah. Because when you drive, you have to pay attention to the road signs, to stop, to yeah. accelerate, to break. And you don't get to enjoy the city or enjoy the views or enjoy the people. You are in a metal cage. And you don't know what's happening around you. You just look forward and that's so. But I think I was also there on vacation. It could be different with people, you know, every day on their commute, the car saves them time. And that's the big reason. And the infrastructure is for the car. Yes. People want to save time. The other issue too, is like coming up like driverless cars. And how that affects cities. It's the same. Like, it's it's still a car. It still takes up room in the streets. And it's not helping out. If you try to put, like, uh, 100 cars an hour into a street that can only accommodate 50 cars an hour, you'll have a traffic jam. Regardless, those cars are driverless or we driver have you heard about it's... uh like surge pricing i think new york is experimenting with it so they they charge like a a fee during rush hours to like remove or reduce um congestion into the city yeah. and like in the areas i don't know the kind of results on it quite yet it's a little too early to tell i think but mm, i will say it doesn't work because we have something uh rather similar here in chile you know our highways are not public in chile but they are privately owned so you have to pay a toll through every okay. single highway you take and uh, yeah, they have special toll prices for peak time and for low time. And um, people will take the highway regardless because they want to get home sooner, more effectively. So at the end, people pay for what they think is a good service regardless, yeah. no matter what, because they want to be seated, listen to music, and they don't want to take the hideous public trans transportation because at the end um when someone gets a car 
and used to ride the bus or ride the metro every single morning and every single afternoon, it's very unlikely that they go back to that because they have a car now and they feel comfortable yeah. with it. Although it's not the most rational way of thinking, they feel more comfortable because they have their own space, their own timing. But as you said earlier, a car can be a huge financial burden because you have to pay not for... Only, not only financial, but mental burden. You got, okay, I got to do this to the car. I got to make sure it's fixed. I got to make sure it's registered. Oh, is it on the correct street for parking? Am I going to get charged, ticketed, blah, blah, blah. It's just like, it was such a... Not having it created like mental free mental <laughs> space having it sure. you don't really think about it um like that but, but yeah chicago has a pretty good infrastructure for public transportation i know you yeah. have some issues with it but overall it gets mainly the job done yeah mostly i have i have many <laughs> comments on how metra works because it it works it has terrible frequency like it has you're talking, no frequency well, metra you're talking metra that goes out to the suburbs the cta yes. is the city yeah like the cta is fine and i really liked their bus service because it was very frequent and yeah, much more living. frequent than yeah there those buses are so cool and they were so frequent, even more frequent than some routes in my city. So yeah. I was pretty impressed with that one. And what to say about the L? It's, it's so iconic to start yeah. with because it's mostly elevated and it's a historical system mm -hmm. and also has very good frequencies. And you can get pretty much anywhere from Chicago's downtown to the suburbs. But the metro was the problem here because they are not integrated with all the other means of transportation. And their frequencies are like every hour, every two hours. And it was like one way every two hours during the morning and one way every two hours outwards to the suburbs. So it's that's the other problem of American cities. They think about public transportation just as a means of going to work and going home. But no, like, okay, I want to go shopping. I want to meet some friends. I want to go to school. I I just want to have, I, I just want to go to the park. Or... Yeah, that's what a car is for. <laughs> yeah. So I they it. don't think about the multiple, multiple options that travelers ha might have in mind when they take transportation yeah okay if we were designing a new city in the southwest america in like new mexico texas kind of area okay we're designing a new city and we want it to be the most efficient and best to serve people's happiness and well-being and dedicated to wellness. What do you think it should have feature-wise? Well, first of all, um, multiple means of transportation and a car-free downtown. Like, okay. let's think a pedestrian-oriented and transit-oriented downtown. It will be like heaven well for myself <laughs> but for most people it will be much better because we associate downtown with noise and pollution but where does the pollution come from where does the noise come from it mostly comes from cars if you think about it even if they're electric when the when the cars uh, accelerate through the street the um, the running wheels will make sound, will make noise regardless. Mm -hmm. Even, even they are even noisier than the motors. And 
Well, um, if we want to make a perfect city, we have to think about first what cities were made for and how cities were like hundreds or thousands of years ago. They were mm. mass compact units and people will walk everywhere, everywhere. Like in that time, cars were non-existent and people will walk everywhere. So I think the, um, the principal aim of a perfect city is to think about it for people and not for not not even for transit or cars, but for people and what is more convenient for people and their happiness. And as as we are very social animals, we have to keep in touch with others. We cannot isolate ourselves from the others. Or I don't I don't I'm not saying like uh befriend everyone that mm. lives around you, but to keep a social network so tight that you will trust the people around you. And when we are together and we have our places for a retreat, when we want to be alone, that works perfectly for our social life. Because sometimes we want to socialize and sometimes we don't feel like it and we just want to chill at home. And that's perfectly fine. But to th think the cities around people is the most important thing we have to think about. Yeah, that human engagement and connection, um, walking, it happens more natural rather than if you're just in your car and you go to work and then when you go home, if you're in kind of like a suburb, you're in, you're again in your isolation, you're not interacting as much with people and you're not quite in nature either so you're not really getting that benefit that humans kind of need to um so you would you would have it people oriented downtown car free i feel that cities are meant to be cities are hubs of people and it creates idea generation and an economic um, geographical location. Like it's it's cities are for cities are for like idea generation an and like cost, maybe economic uh, uh, purposes. Like centers for trade or... Yes, yes. Economic yeah. centers. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Cities, cities are about idea generation and economic centers. And you can't... Those things can't... Can't thrive without people. Lots and lots of people. Um Exactly. So to have these centers thrive, you need people and happy people and the design affects how people interact with each other in the world. Yeah. And now that you bring that up, I, if we think in historical terms, the most prosperous cities in the past were centers for economic activity, for trade and for travelers and there were huge cities and they had no cars. So you don't need cars for cities to thrive. Mm. You just need people. When you think about huge ancient cities such as Chang'an in China, uh, currently Xi'an, or I don't know, um, Rome, for instance, or Constantinople, and those cities thrive without cars, with just people, because they became centers for trade and for economical activity and political activity. And that's the um, crucial 
meaning mm -hmm. when we build cities. We build it for people, not for other means. And those cities grew into a non-rational or non-planned way in which they were so organic and oriented to the necessities of people that they simply thrived for being what they were at their time just for people. Yeah, it's true. And they I were not that. as rational as we have the city now. Like we have this area designated for industry. We have this area designated for um, single family homes. Like cities yeah. were organic. Everything was everywhere. And of course we have to take in account like contamination, pollution. Like I, I would like to have an a factory right next to my house, but I would love to have I don't know, a bakery right next to my house or right under my apartment. It would be great if I want to get bread or if I want to get some groceries in a fast, efficient way. I would just go to the shop right beneath me. And that's all. It would take me five minutes. Yeah. And maybe I can encounter my neighbors or encounter my friends and make the social network more tight. Yeah. Switching gears a little bit, you're going to be you're going to be spending some time in China coming up studying international trade. What are you Hopefully, most energized yeah. for for going to China and where do you want to explore most? Well, it's not my first time in China and I'm really energized for learning new stuff because uh as you know i major in political science so i am rather not very much versed in commerce or trade or anything related to business so i'm really energized for learning new stuff and for improving my chinese and my proficiency in foreign languages yeah. Uh, like I wanted a, a change and um, how to say this um, something new something different that brought me out of my comfort zone and I think I'm ready for that and China is <laughs> the perfect place for that because it's in the other side of the world, it's a totally different culture, and I will have to force myself to speak Chinese everywhere. And I think it's a it's a big um, challenge for myself. That's what I want. It's it's challenge for myself. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And what what city are you going to be in? Shanghai. Maybe. Hopefully Shanghai or Beijing. Okay. I've never lived in any of those cities. When I went to China, I lived in Nanjing for six months. And Nanjing was one of the historical, one of the five historical capitals of China, hmm. along some other cities. And Nanjing itself is a fascinating place and so historic has so many places to go and it has so many international students. It's like a college huh. uh, city, kind of. I I will say Nanjing resembles a lot Boston because it has uh, many oh, yeah. renowned Chinese universities, mm -hmm. has so many students, and it's like an academic capital for China. Yeah, I see that. Huh. Yeah, you... I mean, you just learn a lot just by living there. Not not only yeah, studying, exactly. but like observing everyday life, interacting with cities and areas. Um, yeah, that'd be interesting. I've been to Hong Kong, but I haven't been to Shanghai or Beijing. Yeah. what What city is up there for you to visit and explore? I would like to, well, I've been reading about Chinese history lately, and I would love to visit all the historic capitals of China. 
Mm. And I've been to Nanjing, Beijing, Xi'an, which are just three, but I will really like to visit um, Luoyang, which was uh, the capital of China for many years, and Kaifeng, that was um, the capital of China during the Song Dynasty. And they they don't keep much of their historical buildings or such, but they have some interesting historical sites and museums that I would love to visit and to get um familiar with uh, historic Chinese places. I like I'm so passionate about Chinese history. It's so interesting and so rich. Yeah. Why, so why the capitals? Like, what is to you the significance of that? And what really compels you to, to experience it? Well, um, it's it's like uh, I want to visit them all because there are just five. So it's easier to visit them. Mm -hmm. And they hold a huge historical significance in Chinese history because these five cities were once uh, or currently very powerful and very meaningful for Chinese history. They were the, um, the seed of political and economical and cultural power over China. And they hold a great significance for current Chinese affairs like they were so important sometime and they still hold that important place in current China some of them some of them are mostly like forgotten or less important such as Kaifeng and Luoyang but they still hold some importance and I I would love to be there and they have they have some places like preserved alleys and streets that they backed like hundreds or even oh. thousand years ago. And I would love to see that with my own eyes and experience the see the places I've been reading I've been reading about lately. Huh. What's what's the most interesting period of Chinese history to you? Well, I will say, I haven't read about it yet, but I will say uh, that it's been the Ming Dynasty, which was mm -hmm. actually seated on Nanjing as capital. And it was one of the most powerful and most uh, rich cultural periods for Chinese history of all times. Like, the China... China has been a powerhouse and a cosmopolitan state in so many stages throughout its history. It's like now we think about um, current China about, um, I don't know, 100 years ago as a secluded country, a communist country. But China has much more than just that. And the Ming Dynasty was one of the most interesting parts of Chinese history, and it's really well recorded since um, Chinese improved um, printing on paper and books much earlier than the Western Hemisphere. Yeah. So they have much more history, and even cooking books dating back, like, um, 1500 years ago and they are still publishing them and it's amazing I think that's amazing yeah speaking of books uh, let's see uh, Tao Te Ching I read this book like every day I love it Lao Tzu um, do you know what area of China he was from, or have you been there? Or... Well, you mm, have to let me know no. when you go there for sure. But I actually have a have a very similar book. It's uh, mm. yeah, but the Tao Te Ching. It's called in Chinese Tao Te Ching. It's yeah, like you, um... you know how to pronounce it better than I do. <laughs> yeah, um, 
it's a very important book for the Chinese religion, the Taoism. But the other important and interesting thing about Chinese culture and Chinese political culture is that they are like the oldest political system without a religion, a religious background, you know, because, mm. you know, the United States motto is in God we trust. So mm -hmm. it's heavily based on Christianity and mm -hmm. most Western countries were created um, taking in account the Catholic or Christian religions. But China is totally different. They never take in account any specific religion and they based their traditions mm -hmm. in the um, in a state separated from any religious faith. Yeah. So that makes them very interesting. And the Tao Te Ching, it's um, like the foundation stone for a Chinese religion related more, more than a faith, is more related to a philosophy, you know? Yeah. It's more more of a philosophical kind of book. More yeah, than I'm a, a big I'm a big fan of the Tao Te Ching and uh I read a lot of stoicism every morning as well. Those those two combinations in the morning. Interesting. Yeah. This is a different version. This is a thick version. I I bought this at um Asia on Argyle Street Festival. I used to live in a Vietnamese neighborhood. And um Oh cool. Yeah, so there was some there was this book. I was like, oh man, I read this every day. I want this. This is a different version, a thick version. Um but yeah, I, I enjoy all that stuff. Um exploring philosophy, religion. I I'm I'm interested. It's so well, interesting. Yeah. Well, we're about to uh, wrap up here. I'll I'll ask you this one last question before we head out, and that's what are you what are you curious about recently? What am I curious about? Well, I'll show you right up. <laughs> um, one of the things I've been studying lately, uh, since we had our last conversation, is tarot reading. Oh, really? Yeah. I was always curious about tarot, but never learned about it because it, I thought it's like, um, maybe it's a, it's a scam or something like readers uh, just tell you generic answers to generic questions. But the more I learn, the more it makes sense to me. And the tarot is more of a tool than a... Mm -hmm. um, Let's see, um, something more of like a prescription. Like destiny. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So here's one of my, one of my cards. They are in English okay. mostly because they come from the U.S. And okay. I love them because they have like that little brightness there. Yeah, like the hologram, holographic. Yeah. And, and well, I use them a lot right now. And the most curious that was about tarot I I first asked a friend who's a tarot reader. He's been studying tarot for six to seven years now. And I just started last year. And okay. he, I started being curious, like how you lay the cards, what's the layout, what's the meaning, uh, what if a card is reversed and what is associated with the card, what are the worst cards and stuff like that. And he taught me, I took a course with him as a teacher for tarot reading. And I started learning more about the cards and the more fascinated I was when I was starting to learn about the meaning, laying out the cards and everything. They're just fantastic. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's like, eh, alternative therapy but complementary therapy yeah you, you mentioned it advise. as a tool what what do you mean by that yes. like and how do you use it specifically well the way I, 
it varies depending on the reader. But in my case, uh, the the cards are an extension of myself, as the hammer is an extension of yourself, and you use the hammer to build something. So mm -hmm. I use the cards to see beyond. And I like to say this to my consultants uh, whenever they ask me. I tell them, the cards will show you what you don't see or don't want to see. Mm. So I use them as a tool to see beyond what I can see or I don't see or I don't want to okay. see. So it presents it presents something right in front of you that you have to then think about and answer and it has it will likely provoke a deeper it requires a deeper level of um manifesting something from yourself to answer a difficult question or whatever it may present right yeah well you have to whenever you have a um whenever you get new cards you have to connect with them and i like meditating with them um well it's 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 a complex ritual but um in simple you just check every single card and you think about a story with every single card not the actual meaning, but a story. What do you think about when you see this? And I will start seeing each one and then shuffling them and seeing the other one as um, till I finish the cards mm. and they will be ready. And I will have to lay them for 24 hours um, and they will be ready for reading the night after that. Huh. And... I use them as an extension because some tarot yeah. readers will will just um will like really put their soul onto the cards and that's the way that's when you like can touch the cards or can interact with them if you're not the yeah. actual reader because they have some like energy embedded in them but it's not yeah. for um that's not my method I just use yeah. them as an extension, as I told you. And they're more like a tool. They, mm -hmm. You need your hands to use a tool. Same with the cards. I, it's not like I need my soul or something. Yeah. I okay. just have to put my mind on it. Yeah. Interesting. Well, thanks for sharing that. I appreciate that. You're welcome. All it's right. been crazy. I've never... Like myself, uh, my younger self from five years ago will be very angry with me or will <laughs> mock myself if I told him, hey, I'm reading tarot cards now. Yeah. He'll say, you're such a jerk. Why, why are you doing that? <laughs> well, if, if you five years ago, if you're living the predictable life that you envisioned five years ago, then you're probably not growing or taking challenges or risks perhaps i don't know yeah my younger self will be angry at me well five years ago we didn't have a pandemic in mind so that changed yeah, lots true. of stuff <laughs> yeah it changed a lot of stuff yeah well yeah. thanks for coming on today rafael i appreciate it it's been a great conversation thanks for coming well, thank you so much for having me back. And it's been great to catch up with stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.